we are very pleased to have uh, Mr. John Laplante, Laplante. Laplante with me with us today. Uh, he is currently the director for the transportation engineering uh, in T. Wiley International, based in Chicago. Among his uh, many internet, oh, well, many na national committees, service, uh, transportation committee services. He was the principal author for the Ashto principal design, uh, pedestrian design guide, right? right? And uh, he will talk about retrofitting urban arterial for complete street today. And let's welcome Mr. Lapan. Thank you. Yeah, a little bit, just a little bit more about me. I'm, uh, as you can see on the screen there, I'm a PE and a PTOE. That's a professional traffic operations engineer. Uh, I was city traffic engineer for the city of Chicago and then commissioner of transportation. I was with the city for 30 years. Uh, and then I've been with TY Lin since then. And as Li Ming uh, indicated, I've been on a number of national committees. Uh, Ashto Green Book Committee. Uh, Anyone here not know what the Ashto Green Book is? Okay, cool. Ashto, uh, and I also have lots of uh, acronyms. I'll try and spell those out. American Association of State and Highway Transportation Officials uh, uh, has a group of people that get together and create the design guides, the most important of which is the policy on the geometric design of streets and highways, which no one remembers the title, of, but it's got a green cover, so it's called the Green Book. Uh, and it's the Bible if you're doing street design in this country. And the most recent edition, uh, I did the arterial street design chapter. Um, I also worked with Ashto on the bicycle guide, the 1999 bicycle guide, and I was on the committee that just uh, that helped to put out the most recent bike guide that just came out last year. Uh, principal author of the 2004 Ashto pedestrian guide, as on the MUTCD, Manual Uniform Traffic Control Devices, uh, both the Bicycle Technical Committee and the Pedestrian Task Force, um, on TRB, Bicycle Committee, Pedestrian Committee, uh, Jennifer's here, the Bicycle Committee, uh, and uh, worked with PROAC, Public Rights Way Accessibility Committee, um, and uh, well, I'm on the National Complete Streets Coalition. And that kind of puts it all together. So I've got my my traffic engineering hat, and I've got my bike helmet, and I've got my pet hat, and I've got I just need one hat now. It's a complete streets hat, and so that's kind of what we're talking about today. My wife says I can join any committee I want if I quit two others. So that's <laughs> where I'm at right now. Uh, complete streets. A street isn't complete if it can't handle cars, and trucks, and buses, and pedestrians and bicycles, and people of all abilities. Uh, all of our streets, all of our urban streets, need to be accessible and usable for everybody, and to be safely usable. And we know how to do it. We have lots of complete streets. You in Portland have very good on complete streets. Other cities, not so good. Some of your suburbs, not so good. But we still have streets like this. And can you find the pedestrian out there? Yeah, there he is. We think he's still there. Not sure. <laughs> um, so a policy, a complete streets policy, is one that makes our streets complete for everybody. Um, and it makes a path turn into a sidewalk. You can do it by magic, or you can actually go out and make this happen. Uh, a street, complete street is not uh, a design prescription. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of design of complete streets. There's no one thing say, this street isn't complete, this one isn't. Uh, it's not a uh, band-aid to go out and immediately retrofit all our streets. And it is not a silver bullet. Uh, there isn't just one thing. We still need contact sensitivity. We still need outreach to people. We still need a lot of things. Uh, but it, in, it incorporates all of these things. It changes intersection design from something that's practically impassable 
to something that you can now get across and feel comfortable. You're, you know what a bike lane is? This is a bike line. Yes. <laughs> you don't want that. And you can make something where you feel comfortable riding, riding with your kids, with everyone else. There's a transit stop. Uh, if, you get a, if you're in a wheelchair, you get off there, that's it. You have to wait for the next bus and get on because you're not going anyplace else. Uh, so it makes transit accessible. These are all parts of complete streets. And who benefits? This may be the most important number I want you to remember. One third, roughly one third of all Americans do not drive. They are too young, they are too old, they are too poor, they are disabled, they don't want to drive. One third of the people out there don't drive. If you are a transportation professional, you're responsible for moving that one third, not just the two thirds in cars. They also deserve to be moved. And they also deserve to be able to access the places that they need to go, where they live, where they work, where they shop, where they go to church, where do they go to the library, where do they go to school. These need to be accessible. 55% of Americans would rather drive less and walk more. They say that. And if you give them places to walk, they do it. And transit is growing faster than the population is growing. So transit usage is, is really expanding. And you know that here in Portland, but it's happening around the country. Safety benefits. A sidewalk can reduce pedestrian crashes along a street by 88%. I mean, these are significant numbers. Medians, so you can cross the street half of the time, reduces pedestrian crashes 40%. A road diet, and we'll talk a little bit more about what a road diet is, can reduce crashes 29%, all crashes, not just pedestrian crashes. Countdown signals reduce crashes 25%, all crashes. <coughs> Transit funds, you got money to, to burn? I don't think so. If you have paratransit so you can get people around who are disabled, that's going to cost for somebody who gets, has to be taken to work every day uh, thirty dollars to $40,000 uh, for, for one year for that person. If you go out and make his stop accessible, like a sidewalk from where he lives to where he works, having a place where the bus can pick him up, that may cost seven, ten, twenty, thirty, fifty thousand to do it, but then you've done it. It's done for the rest of time. He is now accessible forever. Health benefits. Americans are, Americans are really good at moving without moving. This is the extent of our moving back and forth. 60% of our adults are at risk for obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure. These are all things that are due to not moving, not getting out there, not being active. If you have a neighborhood that is walkable, people will walk. If you have a connected bicycle route system, people will bike. If there's any place in the country that's demonstrated that, Portland is that city. So you know what, you can see what's happening here, but it, again, it's not happening just here in Portland, it's happening around the country. It reduces traffic. 50% of our trips in our urban areas are under three miles. Those are all bicycle trips. 28% of the trips in our urban areas are under a mile. You can even walk. Those are easy walking trips. And yet, more than two-thirds of all our urban trips under one mile are made by automobile. That's crazy. That's insane. And I'm a traffic engineer, remember. This is, am I speaking heresy? I don't think so. This is what it's really all about. We do know how to build it right. But there are... People believe there are barriers to doing this. There's reasons we can't do it. They say it conflicts with the federal standards and the Green Book and the, and the MUTCD. You can't do that. And if you slow the speeds down to make it safer for people, that's going to reduce mobility and it'll increase costs for everybody. And you know when you design a street and you use federal funds, you're required to design to a level of service C. And for those of you who don't understand that, I'll explain that a little bit. And to the peak half hour, 20 years down the road, that's supposed to be the requirement. Uh, and so you have, you're, you're stuck. You can't do anything about it. And we, can't, we just can't afford pedestrians and bicycles. We just don't have enough money. 
hardly enough money to move the cars. How can we afford to move peds and bikes? So let's look at these one by one. There is nothing in complete streets that conflicts with the national guidelines. This is the Green Book. This is the uh, Ashto Ped Guide. Very important book here. IT Institute of Transportation Engineers has the book Designing Walkable Urban Thoroughfares, a Contact-Sensitive Approach. All of these things in here mirror what I'm telling you today. And I know because I wrote many of them. <laughs> so I know what's in there. And I particularly want to point out, as I said, the, the, the last one, the, the Designing Walkable Urban Thoroughfares, because one of the things it talks about is setting a target speed in your design of roadways, your operating speeds. You don't say, well, this is an, an arterial street, this is a collector, this is so therefore if it's an arterial street, it has to have this kind of a speed. No. You decide what the speed is appropriate for that particular roadway in that particular context, that city, that that urban area, that countryside, wherever you're at. Okay, we say, well, you know, if I reduce the speeds, I'm going to reduce mobility, and that's going to, you know, affect costs and whatnot. Well, what, let me talk a little bit about why speed is so important. If you get hit by a car and the car is going 20 miles an hour, you have a 95% chance of surviving. Pretty cool. Not comfortable, but 95% you're going to live. If the car is going just twice as fast, your survival rate goes down to 15%. So slowing cars down, wherever there are people walking, and if it's an urban area or a suburban area, there will be people walking because there's 35, 33% of us don't drive. Those people are out walking or riding bicycles. Let me play it a little bit different. So I've got a car that's going 25 miles an hour. There's a kid darts out 150 feet ahead. In 25 miles an hour, it's going to take 100 feet before you even put on the brakes. That's your perception reaction time, two and a half seconds. You say, whoa, there's a kid out there. I better stop. I can put my foot on the brake. That's two and a half seconds. That's 100 feet. Now, fortunately, at 25 miles an hour, you can stop in 50 feet. So if the kid is 150 feet in front of you, pretty good. Let's use a different example. Uh, Let's say you're going 38 miles an hour. Let me just use that because the numbers come out nice. 38 miles an hour, you're going to go 140 feet before you put your foot on the brake. Then in the last 10 feet, you slow down a little bit to 36 miles an hour. 36 miles an hour, that kid is hit and hurt. Going back to our chart here, the first scenario, no harm, no, no foul, no crash. Second scenario looks like maybe... Uh, only a 20% chance that kid survives. Speed is really important. We need to control it. And what do we get? Particularly in suburban areas, we get you go 45 miles an hour on your roadways, but then you come to a signal, you wait for a couple minutes. Then you go 45 miles an hour, and you wait for a couple minutes. Why don't we just set the signals for the speed you want people to go at? That works. Set the speed for progression for 30 miles an hour. You can put up signs that say, speed set for 30 miles an hour, dummy. Get people to go the speed you want them to do. You can do that here in downtown Portland. You just, it can be done, it can be done in the suburbs. It can be done throughout the areas. Best way of controlling speeds is use your, your signal timing. There are other things you can do. But let's say, and I had this case in Michigan with Michigan DOT, where I have a roadway, it's five miles long, and we wanted to reduce, it was going through Inkster and a bunch of communities outside Detroit. We wanted to slow the speed down from 45 miles an hour to 30. So, well, you can't do that. If you get down to 30 miles an hour, it's a five mile trip. That's going to be add three and a third minutes delay to somebody going that's five miles. And let's say we got 30,000 ADT, and let's assume 20 bucks an hour for driver costs. We are going to lose over $12 million a year. That is absolute bullshit. Oh, excuse me, are you planners in the word? That's, that's an engineering term. <laughs> the delay is still three and a third minutes. That's the only delay. It's not $12 million. It's three and a third minutes, which is less than the time they take to stop for Starbucks. The benefit is the cars are, knowing, are now going slower and so it's safer, 
It's more comfortable for pedestrians. Say, well, if I'm going to use federal money, I'm going to have to design the level of service C and for the peak half hour and 20 years from now, and that's going to be really big streets. So when you do design for level of service C, this is the street you get. 23 hours of the day. You are taking your money and throwing it out the window. You're complaining you don't have enough money. Here it is. This is uh, happens to be North Las Vegas. Uh, what do you think the speed limit is on this street, by the way? The posted speed limit. Posted speed limit is 30. I'll give a prize to the first person who goes 30. The signs, the the street says, go 50, go 45. The sign says, go 30. The street says, go 50. Go 30. What are you going to pay attention to? They're going to pay attention to the street. And when you have that wide a street, look, there's a bus stop here. People have to cross that street. And there happens to be a signal. They go down to the signal, and they cross the street at the signal. At the signal, I have to put in enough time for the pedestrian to get across the street. That's a wide street. I have to give more time to pedestrians. The more time I give to pedestrians, the less time I give to cars. If I narrow the street down, I can get more cars through here because I can give less time to pedestrians. Traffic engineering magic. It works. It's a win-win. So I'm still moving my, I still got my traffic engineering hat on. I'm still moving cars. But I'm also making it safer for pedestrians I can actually get more cars through and at a so safer, slower speed. And the, so, so even during peak hour, it'll be pretty, it'll be slow enough. But even the level of service C is ridiculous. I only designed a level of service D. I just will not allow anyone to go to level of service C. That's that's just a complete waste of money. And. You know, say you have to do it 20 years in advance and say, well, look, the traffic, the volume just keeps going up and up and up. It can't go up forever. What about the year 2030, the year 2040, the year 2050? Oh, the year th at some point, you will not have any buildings. You'll only have street. You, you know, at some point, it's going to level off. When is that point going to happen? Well, about, oh, it's about 2005. It's been level for the last seven years. It's minor, doesn't it? So if you were saying, well, it's got to keep going up at 2%, it's not going to keep going up at 2% a year. It can't keep going up for 2% a year. And then spending. That's, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on costs here. Because there's things you can do to retrofit your complete streets, and you say, well, you can't perhaps afford them, and what is it going to cost? So let's look first at controlling operating speeds. What does it cost to do that? Uh, the things you want to do to make it better, to control the speeds, is designed to de-level the service, have signals progressed, narrower traffic lanes, road diets, medians, curb parking. Let's talk a little bit about each one. Designing to de-level the service, remember, we're talking about how much it costs. When I designed a D level of services as a C, I've just saved you a whole bunch of money right there. Let's progress the signals. What's the cost? The cost there, you have to interconnect the signals so they can be progressed. You can do that now with Wi Fi. I don't even need to put wire anymore. Not a big cost to interconnect all your signals for the speed you want the cars to go at. How about light lane widths? You do not need a 70 mile per hour lane to handle 30 mile per hour traffic. There is no crash difference between a 10, an 11, and a 12 foot lane when the speed limit is 45 and under. It's an NCHRP study, 3-72, and another one, 3-89. If anybody wants the numbers on that, give me a card or an email address afterwards. I'll send you uh, the the references on that, so you can use that to wave in somebody else's face when they say, oh, i got to have 12, miles, 12 light foot lanes. You do not need 12 foot lanes. And these included trucks and included buses. You do not need 12 foot lanes in an urban area. And don't let anybody tell you different. And the Astro Green Book doesn't say you need 12 foot lanes anymore. I know because I wrote it. So. Narrow travel lanes. Now, again, we're talking about cost. Narrower, less cost. Or 
if I want to put it on a bike lane, I don't have to widen the road to put in the bike lane. I've got room to put the bike lane right there. Road diet. 29% reduction in crashes per mile. A road diet is when you go from four lanes, where the most the classic road diet, you, it's road diet is reducing the number of lanes. And in this case, going four lanes to three lanes, one lane in each direction with a two-way left turn lane. And it reduces crashes, it reduces the rear end crashes, because this person who is stopping to turn left gets rear-ended by the person going wants to go through, and now the person turning left is in his own lane. It also reduces the side swipes because this person wanting to turn left, instead of crashing and then he takes a last minute right into his blind spot. He doesn't see the guy coming up on his right. He has that crash. And the third crash, perhaps even more importantly, is a crash where you have a left turn and a car going through and this car is also turning left and he doesn't, he blocks the view of the car coming up on the inside and they have that kind of a crash. And we met, we put on Lake Avenue, we did a road diet now, this is a street that has 20,000 ADT, average daily traffic. And the crashes at one intersection at Lake and Ridge went from 12 a year to one. And those crashes were all these blind left turn crashes. They're waiting to turn left. They, they don't see anybody coming. They start turning left, and there's somebody coming inside. And that's a serious crash. That's a T-bone. That's a crash that causes injuries. Let's say you can handle a road diet up to 20,000 average daily traffic, 15,000 ADT. I don't even bother doing my synchro analysis, my traffic engineering analysis. Uh, over 15, you might have to, there might be a couple of places where you have to put in a right turn slot if there's lots of pedestrians or something like that. Road diets work, and they slow the cars down. Uh, well, they also bring bikes back, too, because now you have a bike. Well, but I, you know, we, we talk about doing road diet. A lot of people do road diets to get bike lanes in. I get, I do the road diet for safety, and oh, by the way, I've got bike lanes. It's, again, it's something, it's a, uh, a something that I don't stress the bike lane because people say I don't want to narrow the roadway down just for bikes. Now I'm narrowing the roadway down because it's going to save, you know, make it safer. Oh, and by the way, we'll be able to have bikes now. You know. What's the cost when you put it in? When you resurface a roadway, you've got to put stripes back down anyway, so now you put the stripes in a different place. No cost. Well, maybe the symbols if you're going to put in the bike lanes. So it didn't cost you much at all. This is a very low cost. And when you do that, everyone is going slower because everyone's going the speed of the most prudent driver now. Instead of weaving in and around one another, they're all behind the, the slower driver. Everybody's going at that speed. Continuous median, I mentioned before, 40% reduction in crashes because you can cross this part, then you can cross that part. And putting in landscaping has been found to also slow speeds down. So when you do that, when you're rebuilding a roadway, you reconstruct the roadway, put in a, a median wherever you can, and put in landscaping wherever you can. Yeah? Uh, I'm not really sure, but it uh, it just it's been shown. Uh, what's his name in Connecticut? Norm uh, Garrett. Yeah, did some studies that indicated in the streets would have a tree canopy, or just plantings along the street have slower speeds than streets that don't. And so it it just helps make it it calms it calms just it makes it calms you anyway, and it calms the traffic in a way. Yes, Jen. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I keep forgetting. Uh, but go ahead, finish that up, and then we will try and hold questions at the end. Because, yeah, I'm sorry. thank you. So, when the drivers visually are seeing more in front of them, they have to be paying attention, and it, it just it's sending them signals that they should be driving slower, yeah. as opposed to a freeway where, you know, the visually it just says drive fast. That's the theory. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, and thank you for reminding me that. That we should hold questions till the end because this is being televised, and if we don't do that, then they don't know what your question is because we don't have a mic. So, all right. On street parking. On street parking is your friend. 
Eliminating on-street parking encourages the cars to go faster, discourages neighborhood businesses, and by the way, it also increases uh, high-risk crashes. There are more injury crashes and more fatal crashes when you strip the parking than when you have the parking in there. You may get more fender benders with parking, but the serious crashes go down like 50%. So, you put in parking, you say, what does it cost? You can get money. You can, make, you can put in parking meters, you can now make money. So, so far, all these things that I've been telling you about, for the most part, don't cost anything or are actually revenue enhancers. Now you have to cross the street. What's that like? So let's look at some of the geometrics for crossing a street. Tighter radii, pork chop islands, Right, free flow right turn lanes, curb ball balls. When you have a large radius, cars go fast and they ignore pedestrians. When you have a tight radius, it increases the, the when you have the large radius, it's much longer to cross the street. Uh, and so I, again, I need to have more signal time for the cars, uh, uh, for the pedestrians, so there's less time for the cars. So when I tighten up the radii, the pedestrian is in the street for a shorter period of time, and I get more cars because I don't have to give as much time to pedestrians. Another one of those traffic engineering magic things. Same, same magic applied to an intersection. And when you're turning right, you are not required to turn right from curb lane to curb lane. A truck can turn right into whatever is the rightmost lane available. And so the truck can turn into this larger lane. When you have the truck turning here, from curb lane to curb lane, the car is turning much faster. So you need to lay that out so that it can actually work. There are going to be times, oh, and when you do that, when you're reconstructing the roadway, that's when you tighten up the, road, the roadway geometrics. Or conversely, you don't let the state DOT come in and put in a great big radius because they say, well, you got to turn my semi from right lane to right lane. No, you do not need to turn your semi from right lane to right lane. That it doesn't appear any place in any manual. It only appears in people's imaginations. Uh, there's times when you can't turn uh, into the neighbor, the, adjacent, the, turning, the approach street or the accepting street because it's too narrow. So if you only have one lane and you still need to turn trucks, you don't want them crossing over to the center, lane, center line, then you can put in a pork chop island. And that's another way of handling it. Pork chop islands work. They actually reduce crashes also because Instead of having a great big radius, and the pedestrian has to cross from here all the way across the street, now they only have to cross from here across the street. So it, it makes it safer for pedestrians, and it uh, can operate better, provided the intersection is designed so this car comes to a stop when there's a pedestrian here. So this is either under signal control, or it's a sign that says stop for pedestrians. Because if this is a free flow, the pedestrian doesn't have a chance. Pork Chop Islands, you do that again when you're doing roadway reconstruction. I talked about free flow. Here's a free flow situation. These green pedestrians will never be stopped by those, those purple cars. will run them down every time. It's just not going to happen. Here's a uh, ramp uh, south side Kalamazoo, Michigan. Free flow ramp. You can see the go trail here. Uh, there isn't one on this side. We don't think anyone's ever actually made it across. <laughs> And why do you want to do that? You do not want to have a free flow ramp from an expressway onto your local street. When you have a free flow ramp from your expressway to your local street, you're saying, I want you to keep going on the street the same speed you're going on the expressway. That's not the message. You want them to come to a stop and then turn left, turn right. And the same thing coming on, you don't want them to start getting up to expressway speed while they're still on your street. The ramp's long enough for doing that. They come to an intersection, they turn right, now they're on the ramp. Now they start getting up to speed. When you do that, when you're rebuilding ramps, a lot of ramps, a lot of expressways were built in areas that were very rural, and now they've become suburban or urban. And so when the time comes to rebuild that expressway, take out those free flow ramps, put in in the diamond. Curb bulb outs, again, they reduce the crossing distance, which increases the capacity of the roadway. Uh, it makes it uh, prevents encroachment from cars. 
Uh, it improves the sight distance, so a per pedestrian waiting here to cross the street can actually see the cars and they can see them, vice versa. And it makes space to put in your curb ramps, so you have a nice ramp instead of having to have something that's truncated or that's squeezed in. Again, you do this when you're rebuilding the street. You do need to have on-street parking to make this work because it the parking sh shadows it, it shadows the parking and vice versa. So when you have on-street parking, curb ball bolts are a really good thing. And then the signal considerations, talk a little bit about how to time the signals, countdown clocks, hawks, and RRFBs. Signal timing. We used to time our signals in the MUTCD for four feet per second. Our company did a, a, uh, a study for the U.S. Assets Board and we checked it out the average walking speed is four feet per second. Average walking speed is four feet per second. That means that when this light changes, half the people are still in the street. It's not a good idea. Uh, the new walking speed now, and you set your times, you set two times, three and a half feet per second for the flashing don't walk, which is the ped clearance time, which gets to about 85, 90% of the pedestrians. And then three feet per second for the walk plus the flashing don't walk which gets you up to 98 or so percent of the pedestrians. Uh, the last the last two percent are still out there in their walker, but they're out there and they can be seen. You know, they're almost across. So this is the new MUTCD, and this is what you're required to do. When you do that, you take signal maintenance. It costs nothing. Just set your timers different. How about the flashing don't walk? I just mentioned that. No one knows what flashing don't walk means, or 50% of the people do not know. I mean, you may not know. Flashing don't walk does not mean don't walk. Flashing don't walk means continue walking. It means don't start walking, but if you're already out there, it means continue walking. But it doesn't say that. It says don't walk, don't walk, don't walk. So it's just the opposite of what it means. And so we put up signs like this that no one has ever read. Or if they've read it, they don't understand it. Countdown clock is intuitive. I don't have to put up a sign to explain a countdown clock. Everybody understands it. They know what it means. And it works. Fewer people left out in the street. There's actually more people starting during the flash and don't walk when the countdown clocks are there. But there's fewer people left in the street when the light changes. And it reduces crashes, all crashes. 25%. We were worried when I first put them up in Chicago, the police said, well, I want you to put a, bear, uh, a visor so the cars can't see that. No, you want the cars to see it. They said, well, the cars will do dumb things. They'll speed up and they'll be dangerous. It reduces automobile crashes. It reduces rear-end collisions. It reduces T-bone crashes. It reduces a running red light. Cars see it, and they do intelligent things more often than not. So it reduces all crashes. What's it cost? You can put in countdown clocks for $2,000 for an intersection. Don't change anything. Leave the walk. All you do is take the countdown timer and you just tack it up next to, the, to your signal walk signal and tie it in. And it's working. If you want to replace the heads, then you're talking maybe 15000 You still don't have to rewire the intersection. You're using your same timer. All you're doing is just putting in something that displays it differently. The Hawk uh, is now in the MUTCD. It's blank. The, uh, normally, the driver sees the beacon, the pedestrian sees it don't walk, a pet head. They press the button, and then it goes to a flashing yellow, and then to a steady yellow, and then to a steady red for the duration of the walk signal, which may be seven seconds or something like that. And then it goes to the flashing don't walk, which hopefully is now a, a countdown. Uh, and But then for the driver, during the flashing don't walk, from the red, it goes to a flashing red, which means the driver has to stop and yield, but if there's no pedestrian there, they can continue on. They don't have to wait for the pedestrian to cross the whole street. So it works very well. It, the, sig the warrant for a hawk, uh, warrant for a regular pedestrian signal is about 100 pedestrians in the peak hour, 90 roughly. For a hawk, it's only 20. So you, if you don't have as many pedestrians, you can put in a hawk, it costs less a regular signal and it meets the warrants and it has the same level of of uh, safety uh, for in terms of 
motors yielding to pedestrians. Cost half the standard half of the cost of a standard signal and the much lower warrant. And then finally there's the rectangular rapid flash LED beacon. And that's got a, a walk signal on or the walk sign on top with in between here two LEDs that when you push the button to go you can see those suckers a block and a half away. They really work. People do yield to them, they understand them, and it, it is good. Uh, you can you can see the uh, the motors yielding goes from 18 percent up to almost 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent. You can get them with a message, and so when you push the button, the si there's a message that comes on and says, "Wait for driver to stop before crossing." And you can get them with a light overhead that shine when you push the button, the light shines down, on you, and so at night they can see there's a pedestrian there. They're usually operated uh, with. Uh, solar power so you don't have to string wire to them so it doesn't cost very much to install them. You put in four, two facing one direction and two facing the other direction. Work best if you have a little median to put them on in the, media, in the middle. Uh, and, that, and that can be done for $20,000. And you don't have any warrant for that at all. Really works. For non-motorized facilities, what are those costs? In some areas, I don't need sidewalks in every street. If I've got 280 TVs, just the people who live there in a cul-de-sac street, I don't have a problem with that. In urban area, rural areas, shoulders work just fine. Uh, and having a shoulder, by the way, will reduce crashes 70%. Pedestrian crashes, you have a paved shoulder for them to walk on. As I indicated before, having a sidewalk in an urban area reduces crashes 88%. You want to have it with uh, space. You'd like to have a space between the sidewalk and the street, because uh, then it's easier to put in your ramps. Your your uh, your driveways aren't sloped across the sidewalk. You can put in ramps, and you have that separation, and it's it's just a more pleasant place to walk. Uh, you still need five feet of walk. That's what we do is recommend is five feet minimum, because two you need five feet for two wheelchairs to pass. You can go down to four foot at a point, perhaps, but if you want to walk side by side, you get to when you're in a car, you get to drive side by side. Why can't you walk side by side? You know, you're not a second class citizen because you're walking. When do you put them in? When your density gets up there, if you have usage out there, you need to have sidewalks. You can do it as a developer requirement, or perhaps you do it when you're going from open to closed drainage. When you have open drainage, you have a shoulder area usually to walk on. When this gets so developed that you go to closed drainage, the shoulder goes away, and and the cost of putting in a sidewalk when you're going from closed to open to closed drainage is minuscule compared to the total cost because you're already paying for putting in the, the pipes for the drainage, for the regrading, for the new curb and gutter. The cost of adding a sidewalk is 5%, maybe less of the total cost of your drainage project. So you should automatically, if you're going from open to drainage to closed drainage, putting in a sidewalk. So you need a gap infill program. You need a program funded by developers, uh, new roadway construction. Maybe you program a small amount each year. Cities work on it different ways. But you do need to complete your sidewalk network so people can walk. Bicycles, AASHTO, you know, the ones that the, the highway engineers say that all highways unless they're legally prohibited, like some interstates, not all, but some interstates, are constructed, design constructed, and the assumption that bikes will be there, which means you have to plan, design, construct, maintain, operate your streets under the assumption that there will be bicycles on all of them, because there's places that people, bicycles want to go. There are destinations on those streets, the bicycles will be there. That's the only way you can get to the destination. You can have a path over there. And the destination here, the path over there is very nice, but if they're going here, that doesn't do any good at all. They, they will be where the destinations are. Who are the bicyclists? Uh, they're all of us. Uh, this is uh, Roger Geller's uh, thing of looking at. About uh, less than 1% are your, what I call the head down, butt up cyclists. Like are those guys. That's, that's not a lot of your people out there. They're good people. You don't have to do a lot for them. Just stay out of their way. Uh, there's another 7% who are like to 
really get out there and ride and uh, and they'll do it but they're they're not going to go on they're going to put themselves in danger they really like bike lanes and stuff like that another 60 percent uh, are concerned they would like to ride but they just don't feel very comfortable out there and there's 33 percent no way no how my wife's one of those by the way and I, and I still love her. we've been married for 50 years we're okay you know she's not going to ride a bike she did grew up out in the countryside where she couldn't ride a bike and and so she never learned so we did it for a while it was one fun but these are the the 60 percent who's who we're trying to work on and what can we do uh, sidewalks are very low stress uh, adult on a sidewalk though is not a is not a good sign it's low stress for kids out in the suburbs but in the city it's just it's a, it interferes with pedestrians puts pedestrians at risk especially if you're riding against side traffic as they're looking the wrong way when you have bike lanes in you reduce crashes by 50 percent for bicyclists that's just a piece of paint why does that do it because it gets the bicyclists riding in the right direction it gets them uh, it, it gets everybody organized and it gets the, uh, the the bicyclists off the sidewalk on a sidewalk you are five times more likely to be hit than in the street you get hit at the intersections. That's where the crashes occur. And at an intersection, if you're pulling out an intersection, you're not look, looking down the sidewalk to see what's coming. You're looking down the street, and the people coming down the sidewalk get hit. Provide space on streets. And the bike lanes are the best way of doing that on streets. Get you of one town, that's one part of town to the other. You don't need bike lanes on your local streets. Where do you get them? Reduce the travel lane widths. We already talked about that. Uh, putting in there we did this where we had a 44 foot wide street and we went from 8 and 14 to 7 5 and 10 total crashes went down 10 to 15 percent you do the road diets uh, shared lane markings are another possibility if the speed limits are relatively low 35 and under uh, and that's where you don't have enough width to put in a bike lane putting in signing I don't need a sign that says bike route. It's like having a picture of a car with the word street under it. You want to have you have a sign up there. You want to have it tell you where it's going. And or and when you get to an intersection, which way to turn. And then shared use paths. Those are paths that are available for everybody. Uh, and there's there is no such thing as a bicycle path. There never was. Everybody is out there on those paths, including people in wheelchairs. So they need to be accessible. You'd like to have five foot separation when you get to an intersection. You would like to bring it up to the intersection so that they can be seen and so that it slows the bike down so they don't go s across the intersection really fast and not doing something safe. Here's one where you have, and this is a made up intersection where they can go pretty much straight here or they can be on the street. So the guy's turning left, he sees the, this bicyclist, well, the bicycle going this way, it doesn't even bother him. But he doesn't see this cyclist, and he'll never see that cyclist. It's in his blind spot. When he turns, you get a hit. So side paths work just fine, but you have to slow the bikes down and bring them down to pedestrian speed across that intersection. And bollards are dumb. You don't need all these bollards. Uh, cars can get around most of them. I mean, a car could just, just drive up onto this. He doesn't need to, you know, he, he's not going to pay attention to that. Bollards only create crashes. So bicycles, you, you put in your bike, you want to have a network. If you, don't have a, if you didn't have a network of streets, no one would be driving. If you don't have a network of bicycle facilities, they're not going to be riding. Finally, transit. Uh, the bus is the most common mode. Uh, for many people, it's their only mode. The, the, the shelter needs to be accessible. Uh, and putting in the planter strip is a good place to do it. The most important thing to remember about buses is wherever there's a bus stop, there is a pedestrian crossing automatically. They're going to cross the street. They have to go home at some point. They're going to have to cross the street. Wherever you have a bus stop, you have a pedestrian crossing, and you treat them as you do all pedestrian crossings. So you need to make sure that they're there. So we look at the pedestrian crossing part. So all of these barriers, they're all myths. What does a complete street look like? There's no one thing. All of these are complete streets in one step or another. Even a commercial arterial, it's got, you've got weight across in the middle. 
residential skinny streets, historic main street. They're all complete streets. They'll save you money if you fully implement them. Final thought. Designating bikes and peds as alternative transportation is like calling women alternative. <laughs> It doesn't make sense. It's not alternate. It is part of our transportation network. So with that, I'll accept now. Any questions, comments you may have? Thank you. Yes, I'll go back there and then you. Hi, my name is Carrie. Um, I'm an environmental specialization, so terms like, uh, let's see, level of service and stuff I'm oh, not fully um, yeah, I'm educated on, but I was just curious about how you would go about changing those requirements. Like, would you lobby the Federal Highway Administration, or how would that work to try to move that requirement down to level well, of service? Well, I, I did have the advantage of being uh, on the Green Book Committee that wrote those manuals. So the manuals have now been changed. So it's just the people out there who don't know the manuals have been changed. Mm -hmm. uh, the latest Green Book came out in uh, 2010, uh, or maybe 2011. It's, it's very just, I, mean, I guess it was just last year. It was, I think they called it the 2010, but it didn't come out until last year. Uh, and it's, that's all in there. It doesn't tell you to design the level of service C. It doesn't tell you to design with 12-foot lanes. Those are all things that are now in those manuals. And the ITE manual, which I was referring to there, the designing urban walkable urban thoroughfares. That came out two years ago. That is a recommended practice. So the industry is, or the, the feds are on board. The, uh, it's many of the states that haven't caught up yet. And many of the local people haven't caught up yet, mostly because they don't have this training. The more people I can get to courses like this, the more people, more people will understand that and know that. Uh, but that's why the more you know about it, you can then challenge people when they say that. When they say, well, no, I need to have 12-foot lanes. No, you don't need a 12-foot lanes. Uh, I had breakfast this morning with Rob Sadowski, Bike Transportation Alliance, or whatever, BTA, whatever that stands for. Uh, and he was telling me about the uh, move on to by the trucking industry to have all 12-foot lanes. That's bullshit. I mean, that's you do not need 12-foot lanes. There is no... There's a safety. There's a study done in three different states around the country, and it's been adopted uh, by FHWA. It's been adopted by everybody else that there is no crash difference when the speed limit is 45 and under, even with trucks. It's paint. It's not a big wall. So if the truck has a big window, win they maneuver around. They work it out. They don't hurt one another. They don't have crashes. But when you do have all these 12 foot lanes, the cars will go faster, and it will be less safe. So. If you're interested in safety, you want 10-foot lanes. If you're interested in, in uh, making the trucking lobby feel better, then you want 12-foot lanes. So it's your decision. And it's everybody's decision. And people need to know that, though, because people are speaking out of ignorance on a lot of these things. Maybe I'm not supposed to involve myself in local politics. but I, OK, you had a question up here. I was just curious about, um, you mentioned that uh, you designed to a D level of service and yep. not a C. Um, right. Could you speak a little bit about the differences between the yes, two? Yes, okay. Level of service, uh, traffic engineers, like, like all professions, like to, to introduce things so that nobody else understands what they're talking about. So, so we have designed levels of service. A level of service A would be like 3 o'clock in the morning. There's nobody out there. You, you can travel unimpeded without ever worrying about anybody else. The opposite end, level of service F, is like a per parking lot. Nobody's moving. It's just stopping, starting. Not good. Uh, level of service E is right at the, at the point where uh, it's the limit of capacity. So level of service E, theoretically, you can get all the cars through level of service E if nobody does something stupid, like talk on their cell phone, or if it's raining outside, or if they have a flat tire. And then it breaks down, it, then it slips into level of service F. Level of service D is the next part, and, it, and they talk about 
in terms of percentages of likelihood to be caught at a signal. So if you have a level of service D, it's anywhere from 30 to 7% chance you're going to get caught at a signal as you go along the street. And this is during the peak hour. You're designing for the peak, or the peak half hour. Uh, and so that's level of service D. Level of service C is less than a 30% chance. And B is like less than a 10 20% chance. And level of service A is no chance at all. So, so when you decide to design for level of service C, you're saying that you know, we don't want hardly anybody to ever have to stop at a signal. And that is not reasonable in an urban area. I would like people to stop at signals. I would like them to slow down. If I time the signals up for 30 miles an hour, they will be less likely to stop at the signals uh, because the signals will be set for the speed they go at. If somebody is a lead foot and they want to go fast and stop at every signal, they can do that, but that's dumb and they're going to waste a lot of gas and they're more likely to have crashes. So, uh, so, but, but the level of service, does that kind of answer your question about Absolutely. where you go with that? Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned that there, there were, um, if you decrease the speed to like 30 miles an hour, it saves or adds 3.3. You can just do the math. You go 45 miles per hour for five miles, and then you go 30 miles an hour for five miles, and it'll take you 3.333 minutes okay. more. So, and then somebody figured out that it's like 12.2 million dollar a year cost to society. I just did the analysis. This is your standard benefit cost analysis. And if so if you, any of you are doing transportation majors, you're at some point going to learn how to do benefit cost analysis. And, and they are valuable, and they do good things. But if you do a benefit cost analysis, and part of your cost, you're trying to do the time cost. So I say, what does it cost society if we slow everybody down for additional 3.33 minutes? So my and question would be, what does it cost society if we don't? Because if the, the increased cost of the accidents caused seems like they would have a numerical value that would be pretty easy to counter you know your opponents with that would hope theoretically be way over 12 million dollars a year for the increased number of you know lost lives lost you know the yeah we don't the don't have any good data on what the crash what the crashes are at 45 miles an hour versus 30 miles an hour under different under the same Context, okay. and that's the problem. Because okay. a 45 mile an hour uh, roadway out in a in a rural area is not a problem at all, or even okay. 50 or 60. So it it's if it's in a built up area, a highly built up area, slightly built up area, it'll have different costs. And so no one has ever been able to to identify those costs that I'm aware of. Uh, Norm Garrick has been doing a lot of studies in that area, and he's been finding some really neat stuff. And okay. and I don't know. I think there was a study he just finished. That I saw that started to get at some of that, but it's it's not it's not out there yet. Right. It'd be it's neat if you could counter that twelve million with some higher number and convince people that it's worth the money. Yeah, but part of it is just uh, what I what I'm trying to get across on that particular point is that that's an uh, that's an imaginary number to begin with, mm -hmm. and to to say that that is important, twelve million dollars sounds important. But it's not important. It's only 3.3 minutes. It's not $12 million. Nobody has lost $12 million. There's no loss out there at all. That's all imaginary. So, yeah. Oh, is there somebody? You mentioned that um, there's, you never want free flow um, right turns onto the street from an expressway. Uh, are there any other visual or perceptual cues that you should be providing, in addition to, say, a light, um, when someone's leaving an expressway onto a street? Well, the is, major is part is to get them to realize they're on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of the first part is you're not on the expressway. You've come to a stop. You've either a traffic signal or a stop sign. So now they, have, they know they're not on an expressway and they're some kind of control. And then the next part is all the other things I'm talking about the street. If that street looks like that street in, in North Las Vegas, they're th they'll still be on the expressway <laughs> even though they come to a stop sign. So the extent you can bring the street down so that it looks like they're on a street. So that, and having more people out there makes a difference. The more people walking, the slower cars will be because they start thinking, well, there's people around here. If there's more bicycles out there, the more people say, oh, there's more bicycles here. I need to be careful. Uh, that Portland found that out with having as your number of 
bicyclists went up, your bicycle crash rate went down. Because, and mostly it has to do with just having more bicycles. When there's just one bike out there, you're driving along, what's that stupid bike doing out on my road? If every block there's five bikes, you know, that's, that's part of what it, what's out there. And you start paying attention. And so that's another part of letting people know they're in an urban area if it operates like an urban area. So there's like a catch-22 here. The more you, you make things walkable and bikeable, the more people will be walking and biking, and then it'll change the car culture. People always complain, well, how do I change the car culture? You know, these people drive like crazy. What's wrong with those people? They're mostly not paying attention. They're not evil people. They're just not paying attention. They're in their car. And if you do things to make them pay attention, they will start paying attention. And it just it builds on itself. Any other questions, comments? Here we come next. Thank you. Um, I just there was one term on the slides I wasn't familiar with. Uh, street furniture. Street furniture. Okay. Street furniture is when you have the street. Uh, the roadway has like four different zones. There's the curb zone, the furniture zone the pedestrian zone and then another furniture zone on the front of the building. That furniture zone is the area between the curb and the sidewalk that is filled with trees, bushes, uh, benches, uh, light poles, parking meters, mailboxes, oh. all the things that are out there that need to be out on the street, but they don't want to be where the people are walking because they'll bump into them or it makes space for them. So the, the walking area needs to be clear. That needs to be at least five feet. And then the furniture zone is where all these other things take place. Uh, the plantings, uh, the grass in some places. In a downtown area, it's not grass, it's the bus shelter, uh, benches. All those kinds of things are out there. And those are the, that's the furniture that goes on the street. Any other questions? Um, a lot of the people here aren't in the class either. Yeah. It's just well, I, I did this stuff in the 70s. <laughs> I didn't talk <laughs> about this stuff then. Um, in, the, in a lot of the stuff where, where you said that having uh, on-street parking is good, I didn't see bike lanes in those uh, some of those pictures. And, and I, I know that's sometimes considered a problem because of opening car doors. And, and right around here, they have one when they put the bikes be between the cars and the sidewalk. I mean, what do you think about those types of situations and how to... Uh, okay, there's like, for them. Yeah, there's like three different questions there. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I didn't, you know, I didn't have time to get into a lot of that. I've, I have a whole course on bicycle stuff. But, uh, but, I, but coming here to teach bicycles is like Coles to Newcastle type thing. <laughs> uh, but I have opinions on all those things. Uh, number one, you can't put a bicycle lane on every street. But bicycles will be on every street. And so some streets work fine with bikes and others don't. Uh, bicycle lanes in the door zone. I showed you an example of a street that had seven foot parking, five foot bike lane, 10 foot through lane. And that, had, that through lane, by the way, had buses and trucks and everything. It was in Wrigleyville in Chicago. Lots of, lots of vehicles, 15,000 ADT, something like that. The crashes went down. Dooring didn't go up. Car, we, when we've done videos of bicycles on roads with and without bike lanes, without a bike lane, the bicycles ride closer to the door than when you put the bike lane in because the cars are all over the place, so the, the bikes feel like they have to be further over. When you put the bike lane in, they now have permission to ride further away from the doors, so there's less likelihood of dooring with a bike lane. Even though it's in the door zone, there's less likely of dooring with a bike lane than without. The cycle track, which we're talking about where you put the bike, or the various words for that, putting the bike lane on the other side. And I don't know if anybody knows I have a, a green fingernail here, and that's because in, in uh, Long Beach, where I was at the Pro Bike Pro Walk, uh, we had a bunch of people who were pushing cycle tracks and whatnot. And the symbol for the cycle track is to put in a, or at least a protective bike lane, is to have it one, a green lane and then two through lanes. So that, so that's, uh, it's still wearing out. It took my wife two days to even notice I had a green fingernail. So, <laughs> uh, so cycle tracks really work well. But when you have a cycle track, when you get to an intersection, you need to do something. And that's where cycle tracks can be a problem. Uh, and even bike boxes can be a problem. A bike box works really well when the light is red. It gets the bikes up there, then go through. 
Well, now the light is green. It's been green for maybe 10, 20 seconds. The cars are coming up. The bicycles are coming up. The car is turning right. They cannot see in their blind zone. You can put up a sign that flashes, like you've done here. Look out for bikes. It's still a blind zone. That's why it's called the blind spot, because it is blind. Putting up a sign that flashes doesn't make it any less blind. You cannot put up a sign that re re repeals the laws of physics. You cannot see something that you cannot see. And a convex mirror, a bicycle, is this small. You're not going to see them coming up. So you need to have some way of either pushing them together or having a separate signal for bikes and turns, like they've done in New York, Washington, D.C. So there's different ways of handling it. But pretending that you've solved it with a sign or an ordinance is not going to do it. So I know I've just treaded into some place where I probably you know, started another whole hour of discussion, which we can have. I believe it's 1 o'clock now. Yeah. So, so I do want to let people know that you don't have to stay and listen to me anymore if you don't want to. But I'm, but I'm willing to continue talking about all these issues as long as you want. Thank, Thank you, you very John. much. Great presentation. Thank you.